made a synopsis <coughs> of each uh, chapter. So if you would help me to read the sections, if you won't, don't mind just reading the sections as we go around, we can stop and talk about it at any point, okay? And if you can't see this, um, I can pass this around and you can read it from this, okay? I'll just, I'll just start with that. So, um, I <coughs> actually, I don't think I can make it to the first one. So, Jen, um, Gladys, you just want to start with the Elephants of the Cornfield, the Politics of Agriculture and Climate Change by Chris Clayton. In January 2011, I was in Atlanta for the American Farm Bureau Federation's annual convention. A few Farm Bureau staffers were boastful that they had defeated the waxman marquee Climate Bill. I argued the issue of climate change would not go away. Somewhere in the elevator leaving the bar, I declared I need to write a book about this and better understand the topic. My first question to myself, am I supposed to write to the farmer who doubts the science, or am I supposed to write for the farmer who doubts the science? Is there any way to do both? I knew I had to start by pointing out the elephant. The elephant of the foreign field represents my eight-year journal reporting on federal policy conservation through production, politics, and climate change. together his transition team after the 2008 election when the rumor mill in rural America picked up wind of the dreaded Caltex. There is no disputing the Federal Register stated EPA could impose an emissions permit fee on livestock that would be as much as $125 per dairy cow and $20 per hog. That comes out to nearly $1.6 billion in taxes just on dairy cows. The whole Federal Register report offered a primer on greenhouse gases and the push to begin regulating them in the 1990s. The four gases were initially tar four major gases were initially targeted: carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and hydrofluorocarbons. Essentially, synthetic refrigerants considered far more important potent than carbon emissions. After EPA had rejected petitions to regulate those gases, lawsuits were filed leading to the U.S. Supreme Court case, Massachusetts v. EPA. A 5-4 to four decision in 2007 concluded EPA was not doing its job, but the agency didn't regulate greenhouse gases. The American Farm Bureau Federation set out a news release about two weeks after the 2008 presidential election that will American Farm Bureau opposes EPA proposed tax on livestock. The cow tax went from being speculation by staff at USDA to becoming a penalty actually being created by EPA that had to be stopped through legislation. Senator Chuck Schumer, Democrat of New York, and Senator John Thune, a Republican of South Dakota, introduced a bill in March 2009 a tax on cows and their emissions. Congress yet added a provision in a 2009 funding bill to make sure EPA could not require farms to get emission permits. Resolutions flew from farmers opposing regulations on greenhouse gas emissions and opposing the idea of global warming in the process. This next part is about um, the aquifer. The aquifer. And I just, here, started out with old Nebraska. Um, this is, this is, there we go. I left out, um, a, well, I have to read out, read out a lot of stuff. I left out the really important uh, part about the activists working with Native American groups because all of us know about that already. 
what happened to them. All of us, yeah, we're pretty much aware of that. What I tried to focus on was policy because a lot of this is, is not as, we're not as aware of. Okay, Bo, before I ask you, one of the first things that struck Art Tandera when he began to fight the Keystone XL pipeline was that farm groups largely weren't helping farmers oppose the pipeline. And a lot of groups, in fact, supported the pipeline. And groups farm just north of Neelai, Neelai Nebraska, but came home for one of the last stands against Keystone, against Keystone. Tandrup's farm is about 120 feet above the water table. The farm is on the northeastern tip of the Ogallala Aquifer, one of the world's largest underground lakes. The aquifer stretches from the southern edge of South Dakota down through the Texas area of the Ogallala roughly 37% of the entire aquifer. To put it another way, 83% of Nebraska's land site on top of the Ogallala period. The Ogallala gives us crops such as corn, soybeans, sorghum, hay, and can canola to feed, to feed the livestock and produce ethanol. Um, let's see, what's the, we'll get you a different one. It should be noted that the Ogallala Aquifer has been uh, pumped uh, well in excess of recharge uh, for decades now and is declining. So yeah. pretty soon there may not be much water left to contaminate if the pipeline does move. Right. Can I make a comment? Sure. See, it sounded like in the opening couple of sentences of this section that, that the so-called foreign groups that are mentioned, the uh, Farm Bureau for one, but the other, I guess, supposedly, groups that are supposed to be supportive of farmers aren't really supportive of farmers. There's, what they are is they're against the whole idea of global warming, and they're in, conservatives, they're against the whole idea of and regulation. regulation. They're against regulations. They, they, right, they could, they're not supporting the farmers when it comes to the pipeline issue. Right. Okay, but they're all in, they're all in favor of uh, subsidies, government subsidies. Oh, well, We're going to be getting into that's that. Another, We're going to be that's getting another into that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I heard recently uh, in a, at a meeting that I uh, attended the press, the current president of the Farm Bureau, uh, give up just a, a talk on their position, and, and they they are so happy with uh, the policies of the current administration because they they are uh, just hammering uh, as much as they can the EPA and all those regulations. So they they are definitely. They only rep yeah, they represent whatever. the conservative farmer, right? The American Farm Bureau has been one of the most oppositional to any action for conservation. I mean, they'll say they're for conservation, but they're against any policy that would encourage any kind of regulation, which I think is going to raise costs. I, I think the position they take is in anything that in any way uh, constrains their uh, ability to either produce more or gain uh, more revenue or subsidize, they are against. But they are also representing the fertilizer companies mm -hmm. and the companies oh, yeah. that sell machines and everything that outfits the farmer that's costing the farmer all this money that they won't need for more conservation. There's the Farm Bureau. Involved. The Farm Bureau. I thought they're supposed to represent farmers. There are other. Not the companies. They're supposed to. <laughs> they represent the companies. I thought they are included in that. That's included in that. Let's, let's finish it. This is all going to be covered in, in the book. So let's read a little bit more. <laughs> the pipeline began as just another old infrastructure project to carry about 830,000 barrels a day to bitumen, bitumen, tar sands oil. In Canada's tar sands in Alberta, 
pipeline would stretch roughly 1,700 miles behind the of Texas refinery. The pipeline, though, became controversial quickly in, in the press. State and federal officials expressed concern early on, early on about the risk of the aquifer and sand hills under the initial plan for Keystone XL. Even Senator Mike Joe Yohans, a proposed and informed governor, wrote the U.S. State Department raising questions about Keystone. Yohans wrote to Clinton, I do not appreciate, I do not object to coal pipelines in Nebraska. There is a heightened environmental sensitivity when the pipeline traverses an irreplaceable natural resource, the Oklahoma aquifer, with good examination of potentially preferable alternatives. Yet by 2012, Keystone would be a presidential decision. Pushed by Congress to make a decision, President Obama rejected the pipeline route and Confirmed it, setting up a battle with Republicans both in and out of Congress that would stretch on for the next three years. The American Petroleum Institute was incredulous over the decision. Both sides barred <laughs> over the environmental impact and the alleged number of jobs Keystone would create. Transcanada acquiesced to Nebraska's desire to move the route from crossing the heart of the Oklahoma to the area to an area <coughs> with less depth and breadth of the true rock. Changing the route first seemed to undercut one of the biggest arguments against it. Nonetheless, the pipeline would still cross people's farms, ranches, communities, streams, and rivers. Those folks helped grow the opposition to building any new pipeline at all. The opposition to Keystone shifted to raising issues about its effect on greenhouse gas emissions. Why are we digging up the dirtiest hole on earth only to pump it halfway across the country so we can so we can refine it just to then send that refined oil to another major polluter of China. With the pipeline route moved, Joe Hines, Nebraska Governor David Heinemann, and others could, could get on board. Heinemann, who was criticized, who criticized the earlier route, approved a new pipeline proposal in early 2013. Canberra saw that the same people fighting for the pipeline in Washington, D.C. were the ones fighting to defeat or hamper the Renewable fuel standard. Renewable fuel standard is the standard that we have to use so much of the biofuels in the mix of um, the gasoline. <clears throat> Which has been one of the key drivers for both boosting corn demand in and Nebraska. Yet some farm organizations in the state were backing the pipeline project. People aren't relating to the pipelines to the fight in Washington, D.C. with the petroleum lobby over the renewable fuel standard, Tanner said. They aren't getting that, that correlation that, that it's these oil companies that are shutting that down. In the midst of the battles between the petroleum industry and EPA, the agency basically fought into the argument that something needs to be done to reduce the mandates set by Congress in 2007. The oil industry argued that the infrastructure wasn't in place to sell higher plants of ethanol or biodiesel, and there weren't enough vehicles on the road to run on 15% of ethanol. The main reason the oil industry could make the argument is because oil companies had refused to invest in pumps and gas stations spend their money on the new com competitors to their core product line. The 36 inch pipeline would have four bins within two miles in the area around Tanneroff's home. The steel being used to move bitumen you know, yeah, it would be, be far in the, the pipes from India. They would be about a half inch thick and 
calling chemicals and solid mixes that would grind up the pipe over time and potentially erode the pipe itself. McKibben touched on the current drought, which the entire state of Nebraska is now in. It was pointed out that as the climate change crop production will simply have to move. But McKibben noted that crop production is where it is because it's where the soil and the water are. Moreover, globally, every one centigrade, centigrade increase in temperatures will yield 10%. Cut yield 10%. I'm concerned about this pipeline because it sounds like it's not, they haven't done anything to strengthen the pipes since that big oil spill in Mayflow in Arkansas a few years ago. Well, why did just burst <laughs> a few months ago? It was, it was the first pipeline that was going in another, uh, it wasn't the Keystone one that they've been working on, but another one, an older one, just uh, just burst and they had a big spill of it. Trans no, Canada has a terrible them. record. Yeah. yeah, they're not making any changes to the pipelines themselves, which means there's no guarantee that they're going to be any safer tomorrow than they are today. Well, not only that, the, the one burst because the pig, what does the pig stand for? It's the monitoring system. They had disabled the monitoring <coughs> system because it's too expensive oh. to run it. It's this little thing that fits inside the pipe oh and boy. that lets you know if there's a weakness in the pipe. But they, they were supposed to check it like, what, you know about this, Linda? You want to tell us about it? it, it yeah, you have to constantly test the pressure because you've got it coming from above the weight of the earth or the weight of the ocean, if it's underground. And beneath and that's one of the things that was the problem with the big blowout. Right. Yeah. I think it's a pressure in they the age. They use the yeah and they, they <coughs> used a blowout preventer there that we use for earthen for earthen wells. Did not have any business being thousands of feet down in an ocean. Right. And they just got rid of the group. That the, the requirements that now oil companies have to get a whole room full of people to determine every single piece of equipment in an oil well to make sure it's safe. Trump just got rid of that uh, requirement. So, right. thanks for bringing us up to date. Too expensive, too regulatory. They don't yeah. want to Kelly, put any. Right. And it was a, and a Kelly Bushy, by the way, isn't that expensive? Yeah. They, oh, they, <coughs> okay, let's go on. One key problem in Nebraska is the belief among opponents that TransCanada should not have any power in the domain. That became part of the fight with the state officials who were willing to give TransCanada that authority in Nebraska. There was also a lack of opposition to pipelines by groups such as the Nebraska Farm Bureau. Yes, we believe a major organizer is fighting to express their annoyance with both national environmental groups and national Democrats who seem to be willing to walk away from rural America. That was one of the most frustrating things when I, when I started working with national groups is that they see farmers as these anti-environmentalists. Every day they touch that land, it makes no sense. I want to say something here is that's another reason that the Citizens Climate Lobby decided to have a farmers forum because in so many ways, farmers and environmentalists have the same goals. They want to protect their land. They want to do conservation. We want them to protect the land, but we're not speaking the same language. There has to be a mutual understanding, so that's what we're going to be working on. So we just want to hear from the farmer, what is the language you use? What are the risks you face? What can we do to help them understand what you're doing? The President's decision came after TransCanada sought to put a hold on or pause on the process. TransCanada had asked the Secretary of State's office to table the decision. After TransCanada began facing more administrative battles with public service commissions in Nebraska and South Dakota, 
battle of the Keystone continues, however, because Trans Canada believes it could see the U.S. reverse its decision under a new president. I'll just come up here. This, uh, right, this ended in 2015, so we're, this, 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 is, this is history that we're looking at. Um, Are we going to read this whole thing? Is she, she going to read the whole thing to us? We're passing it around. We're passing it around. Yes. This, I had, maybe you missed what I said earlier. I, I did, um, in order to organize this, which was difficult because it's so dense, um, I got it down <laughs> to 28 pages. And what I did was um, make a synopsis of each chapter. Some chapters we can skip over. If, because we probably won't be able to get through it all. But meanwhile, it's a lot of history, and I think it's important. So if you can sit through it, please do. The golden age of farmers. Rural America is at the heart of the country's struggle, and the choice that needs to be made about the climate change. Still farmers and the majority of people in rural America generally remain skeptical about climate change. Big commodity farmers are coming off a six to seven year run called by some the golden eight era of agriculture. Farmers deserve their income. <coughs> they rely on the essential ingredients for any society, food. Yet some farmers also forget they couldn't have achieved their recent success without a long established policy of cheap food in the U.S. that over time has developed, tested, and been polished. We subsidize farm prices, conservation efforts, crop insurance, natural disasters, food for the poor, housing, water lines, sewer infrastructure, phone and internet services in rural America. Policies that help make corn the king of commodities revolved around the concept of renewable energies that reduce greenhouse gases. It's called the Renewable Fuel Standards, or RFS. Ethanol from corn was the primary winner. The two energy bills passed in 2005 and 2007 did for rural America what the 2009 stimulus bill failed to do for the rest of the country. Those energy bills spurred the economy in the Midwest and the Great Plains. Higher grain prices spurred by ethanol also lowered over overall direct federal subsidies for grain farmers. Yet ethanol played a part in outright market speculation on food commodities, raising prices for livestock producers and consumers like paint to eat and protein. We make a long-term trade-off of having policies on renewable fuels without also having incentives to sequester carbon in the soil. When we drive up prices for commodity crops, we push for more cropland to go into production. Landowners who kept marginal ground, ground idle now see a chance to make more by trying to farm it. In addition to converting pasture, conservation, and marginal or fragile lands into crops, we're also sending more fertilizers and pesticides downstream in the process. One half of the topsoil of Iowa has been lost over the past 150 years. Strategies highlighting the conservation rate, the conversion, I'm sorry, the conversion rate of ground in the Dakotas and other states project so soil erosion rates have increased since the carbon boom. Corn boom. Corn boom began. Pollution and erosion are degrading and depleting soil and its ability to sustain food production for the coming generations. Climate change offers American farmers a chance to finally come to grips with their long-standing environmental issues, soil degradation, and water pollution. After all, they could end up getting paid money for doing the right thing by the environment. They have ecosystem services, which translate into paying a landowner or a business a payment or credit for doing something that aren't paid they aren't being regulated to do. It's the carrot and the old adage, carrot or stick, with the fear of regulation being the stick. Everyone follow what's going on? That's an important passage that you read. It's got a lot of information in that. Yeah. And that one sentence on subsidies, 
I've never read a sentence that brought all those the multifarious subsidies that skew our economy as well as that one sentence you read. What's the name of this section? I want to um, get back to it later. What was the name? Golden Age for Farmers. Oh, the Golden okay. Age for Farmers, right. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Getting into some climate forecasts, I left, they had, you had a lot of information about climate change. I left most of it out because most of us already know all that. I'm still kind of focusing just on policy here. Can you read the next one? Sure. Digging into some climate forecasting. Charles Keeling's initial measurements of carbon dioxide in the late 1950s and early 1960s at Mauna Loa validated the argument that greenhouse gases from fossil fuels are increasing globally. His mentor, Roger Revelle, mm -hmm. chaired, pardon? Mm -hmm. yeah. chaired uh, chapter work for a 1965 report to the President's Science Advisory Committee about fossil fuels. Atmospheric carbon dioxide, quote unquote, the report to President Lyndon B. Johnson. Restoring the quality of our environment is considered the first major U.S. government reference to global warming from fossil fuels. In 1979, a group of scientists writing for the National Research Council put together carbon dioxide and climate a scientific assessment. The report estimates that the probable warming for doubling carbon dioxide emissions would be three degrees, cent uh, three degrees centigrade, about 5.4 Fahrenheit. But it offered an arrow range of plus minus 1.5 centigrade. There's a reference on that if you want me to dig into that for anybody that's not there. To offer some context on that temperature range, a town like North Platte, Nebraska, that have the same average summer temperatures in the 2080s as Lubbock, Texas has today. We were sitting at 396 parts per million of carbon dioxide at the end of 2013. If that were